Hello, I'm delighted to welcome Martin Edwards and Nicola Upson to the BIF digital event on the golden age of crime fiction and its influence on their own novels. Hello, welcome. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Hi. Nicola. Just a quick introduction. Martin Edwards is a prolific crime writer of both contemporary and historical crime fiction and also the author of studies of classic crime, including the authoritative The Golden Age of Murder. His latest book, Mortmain Hall, features criminologist Rachel Sevenake, and he's also editor of the British Library series of crime novels. I've got some of them behind me here. Um, and also this year's recipient of the Crime Writers Association, Diamond Dagger or in recognition of his achievements. Um, Nicola Upson is the author of eight critically acclaimed and CWA Dagger shortlisted crime novels featuring Golden Age writer Josephine Tay as, its protag as, as their protagonist, the latest of which is Sorry for the Dead. She's also the author of two non-fiction books and the novel Stanley and Elsie with artist Stanley Spencer at its centre. Um, I'm Sarah Ward, I'm a crime writer who lives near Buxton and I'm joining the historical crime fiction tribe with my book The Quickening out in August. So I'd like to dive straight in with the subject of this panel, the golden age of crime fiction. Martin, if I can start with you, for those yeah. watching who might not know what the golden age is, can you just tell us what, what period we're talking about and a little bit about how you discovered the golden age writers? Yes, well, uh, the golden age, it's one of those terms that can mean different things to different people, but I, I think it's generally accepted as being the period between the two world wars from uh, roughly the end of the First World War to, to the Second World War. Um, precise dates, I don't think, matter, but uh, it was really a response to the First World War. Uh, people wanted fun after, the, after all the tragedy and all the slaughter. Uh, that's where the game playing came in, in the 1920s. And then in the 1930s, it continued. And then, of course, uh, the Second World War came along and changed everything, including crime fiction. So it's really between the two wars. And I came across it as a small boy when I discovered Agatha Christie and decided that I, too, would like to write detective stories just like Agatha Christie. It's just that they don't sell quite as many copies. <laughs> So, so Agatha Christie was one of your early influences, was she? Absolutely. That was the first adult fiction I ever read. I, th I think that's true of many people in, in many different countries because mm -hmm. uh, it's so accessible. The prose is so simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely fell in love with the idea of the puzzle. Uh, and uh, I read literally every detective novel she'd written. She's still alive at that time. So I was waiting for her to write the next one. And whilst I waited, I, I discovered other writers like Dorothy L. Sayers, uh, people like that, Marjorie Allingham. And then I moved on to the people who were contemporary at that time in the 1960s, people like Julian Simmons and Michael Gilbert. But it, really it was the golden age was where I began. Great, thanks, Martin. And what, and what about you, Nicola? We'll be coming on to Josephine Tay when we talk about your own com crime novel. But was she the first writer that you came across from the Golden Age tradition? Not at all, no. Uh, she, I was actually quite a late developer when it came to Josephine Tay. I since discovered that lots of people read, particularly the Daughter of Time, in their teens, they read it at school. But not for me. She came much later. Like Martin, it was Agatha Christie for me. Agatha Christie came straight after the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. I Same here. <laughs> and I love I love her titles. I think I was I was drawn in by the titles and those fantastic hand covers that they had in the seventies, which were wonderful. So I loved her plots. And I think it's interesting, isn't it? For me, that the golden age, it is summed up by by that kind of interwar thing. But some of my favourite golden age novels, and indeed Tay herself, wrote her best work after the Second World War, so strictly yeah. that period. But I think, and going back to Christie as an adult, I think the danger maybe is that when you read Christie as a teenager, you lap it up, like Martin said, and you get through the lot. Um, and then going back to as adult, I appreciated different things in her mm -hmm. and I appreciated its ruthlessness, its barbed humour. Yeah. Uh, everything that wasn't fluffy and cosy and, and perhaps the things you pick up yeah. when yeah. you're younger. Uh, and the things that are played on in, in the various television adaptations, or, or not more recently, but, but some of the older ones. And so it's been lovely to come back to Christie, and I love Marjorie Allingham too. Uh, I think she, like me, is, is wonderful at character. Uh, and it is that kind of psychological, character-driven element that I really love about those books now. Yeah. 
And I think quite a lot of people have come to the golden age either for the first time or um, are revisiting it during lockdown. Um, given that a lot of the golden age isn't that <laughs> cosy, what yeah. do you think it is about um, golden age crime novels, that classic crime that people love when times are quite hard out in the real world? <laughs> well, I, I, I think escapism is always attractive. It's, it's always attracted me uh, for an entire lifetime. And um, there is something, even if the story itself is about murder and, and can be, uh, the, some of the psychological suspense novels quite quite dark, as you say. But escaping into another world is very attractive. And there are times uh, when you think, yeah, that, that other world is really where I'd love to be. <laughs> I think the, the, yeah, the British Library uh, crime classics have benefited from that feeling. I think it's been quite widespread. It's certainly not confined to Britain. It's not confined to America. It's it, it's it's a, almost a universal longing for for escape and something different, but also something that you can feel is anchored in in a kind of fictional universe that's rather attractive. Yeah, I also think there's something unique about the Golden Age novels, which is they are, by their very nature, about community, whether it's a village or a country house. They are about a group of people being brought together, often in, in, in a lockdown of its own. So I think yes. there's something about that contact that we find quite special and quite reassuring. And I also think that, and again, Tay is the exception in this. I, I find myself saying that a lot about Josephine Tay. Every time you spout a rule about Golden Age fiction, <laughs> you qualify it by saying she didn't do it. But there's something quite reassuring in the Golden Age about all those forces of law and order being devoted to the fact that one person has died. That, that, there's something very humane about that, particularly at the moment, I think. It's like after the First World War when the numbers of people dying every day on our, on our news and on their news, it's almost unimaginable. So the fact that one single death can have the focus of attention for the period of reading that book mm. is actually quite a reassuring, compassionate thing. Um, mm. Yeah. So st staying on the sort of subject <coughs> of, of Golden Age um, in general, um, What's quite interesting is there were so many writers, and some are very mm. still very famous, like Agatha Christie, mm. Mm. which I'm sure quite a lot of the viewers of uh, most viewers have heard of. But are there any particular names that sort of fell by the wayside that you would recommend? Is there anyone sort of less well known that you suggest? I know, I know Martin, you must have <laughs> <laughs> lots of people. <laughs> if someone was watching and would like to try a, a golden age <laughs> crime novel, who would you suggest? <laughs> Well, well, I'm I'm a big fan of Anthony Barclay, and one of the who also wrote is Francis Isles, uh, two or three books under that name, and he was he was interesting because he was very ambitious. He was Agatha Christie's favourite detective novelist. He he wrote books that were innovative and daring and fun. Uh, and he also pioneered the psychological suspense novel as well, books like Malice of Hawthorne. Francis Isle's story. So I think that although some of the books are flawed, uh, there is a lot in them that's very appealing. And uh, uh, one of the great pleasures with the crime classics has been bringing back one of my personal favourites, which is also Christie's favourite, which was the Poison Chocolates case, which oh, is, a, is a lot of fun. Yeah, it is great. What about you, Nicola? Is there anyone, anyone you would recommend? I love uh, Christiana Brandt. I think oh, she's yeah. British, most famous now for being the creator of Nanny McPhee. Uh, but she wrote, I that. Yeah, she yeah. wrote in particular a novel that I absolutely love called Green for Danger. And again, yeah. it's, it, it's the setting, it's, the, it's set in a hospital. And, and there is something very, it's a war hospital, very atmospheric and, and character driven about those books. So I love her. And I also am a huge fan of Edmund Crispin just because I think anybody who can combine humour with crime um, is, is fantastic. My partner, Amanda, she writes a, a series of funny comic, dark crime novels. And I think the kind of humour that Crispin brought into his writing while still being proper, in inverted commas, detective novels, is, is a really kind of thing to do. Mm. Mm. Right. Um, yeah. so, move, so moving on to um, your own uh, novels. I'll start with you, Nicola, um, because when you were deciding I want to write a crime novel, um, you put a real life character, uh, a real life person, real life crime writer, Josephine Tay, as your main protagonist. Can you say a little bit about 
um, why you did that and what were the potential pitfalls in doing so? Well, it was, it was slightly more tangential than that, really, because I started out, I'd never written fiction, and I started out working on a biography of Josephine Tay because I loved her work. I thought they were so different from everybody else. And also I was fascinated by her other career as a playwright. She wrote a play called Richard of Bordeaux in the early 1930s, which mm -hmm. launched feel good on his career. And so I set up to write a biography because I didn't think she'd have to be a claim that she deserved. But I don't know, these pesky writers who keep their lives private, she rolled the carpet up very closely. And there, there wasn't enough information to write a fully objective biography of her. Um, even though I spoke to people like Gilgood who had known her and worked with so that was a great thrill. And it was actually Amanda, my partner, one day, who said, oh, for God's sake, just make it up. <laughs> um, that's really how the book started. Once she said that, the idea of, of following Tay's life through a series of uh, fictional murder mysteries, the, the genre we know her best for to this day, was just really too delicious not to do because she was a fascinating woman. Not only are her books ahead of her time, but her, her life was ahead of its time in lots of ways. Mm. And the gaps in her life then became perfect for fiction, whereas they hadn't been for non fiction. Um, the pitfalls, of course, are that. Although Tay isn't as well known as Christy or Sayers, the people who love her really love her. So I was worried that they might, and, and this was a long time ago, that first book and expert had a long gestation period. So I was worried because pe putting real people in fiction wasn't as, as done as it is now. Mm. So I was worried that they would take against it. And there are a few people who will never like the idea of real people in fiction, um, no matter what, and that's fair enough. But I'm delighted to say that a lot of the Tay fans have, have come to these books. And also the flip side that people, there was a woman who, who came to an event recently when we still had those lovely things called events. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, oh, I got to the end of book five and I didn't even know that Josephine Tay was a real person until I read the author's notes. So it's nice that they're then going on to discover those, those delights of those eight crime novels, which I still think is the test of time too. And, and, and does it add significantly to your research, though? Because when you're writing historical crime, you have to do, I've discovered, a lot more to research. <laughs> <laughs> contemporary crime. And you added onto, onto that, you've got a real person. So, for example, in your latest book, um, you've got Duncan Grant, a, 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 a real person as well. So are you making more work for yourself? <laughs> well, I suppose I am, but that's the lovely part. And, and uh, I, I, you might agree with this, I certainly think it. The more research you can do, putting in the time when you actually have to sit down and, and, and write, because the research is a joy and the writing can be a bit bloody sometimes. Uh, so, yeah, I do love that. But that's the nice thing about the books, because through Tay and through finding out more about that period, I'm finding some wonderful people uh, to, to bring, uh, people who are not necessarily even as famous as Duncan Grant or Alfred Hitchcock, who is in another book. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Mary Size, who was the deputy governor of Holloway Prison, or Rowena Cade, who started the theatre in Cornwall. These are really pioneering, groundbreaking women who I have a huge amount of respect for. So it's lovely to bring, and indeed in the context of Hitchcock, the most interesting thing about the research for that was finding out all about Alma Rebel, who was Hitchcock's wife, and who yeah. actually had such a big contribution, not just to his filmmaking, but to filmmaking in general. Mm. So yeah, it is a lot of work, and the research on tape is ongoing, because every now and then there'll be a, a new letter or a postcard or a comment from somebody else that you knew that, that will pop up. Um, but it, it's lovely, and I love that part of it. Oh, that's right. Um, Martin, um, you, you'd written, um, an a whole body of work um, set in, in, in contemporary uh, times. And, and yet, you see, it would have seemed an obvious step to move into the golden yeah. period since yeah. you'd, you'd read and knew so much about it. Can you say a little bit about what, how your first book, Gallows Court, in the series came into being? Um, uh, what, what made you decide to go into the, into the historical crime? Yes, well, I've, I've always tried as a writer to, to keep doing different things, to, to keep myself entertained uh, uh, and, uh, and and informed as, as, as well as readers. And I, I think staying fresh is really important as a writer, trying to develop, trying to stretch your talents uh, uh, as far as you can. Uh, so, uh, so I'm always looking to do different things. I've, I've written a, a lot of sh short stories with historical settings in different periods. And I, I was at a point with my writing where um, the golden age of murder had done pretty well. I was, uh, 
someone who'd always had this this interest in golden age fiction. And so the idea of writing a novel set in 1930, which in some ways is a pivotal year in in the development of the golden age, uh, was quite attractive in itself. And then I had the idea for a, a character. Now, in the past, I've tended to write books knowing the solution. I'm, I've been that kind of writer who, who plans it out. And even if I don't know how exactly the detective will get to the answer, I know what the answer is at the outset. But Gallows Court, I decided to do something entirely different, to write a book without a contract, without a publisher uh, in a different period, and write it in a different way, just as an experiment to see what what the outcome was. Uh, and it because the, the idea of the character appealed to me. And I wrote a short story about this woman, Rachel Savonake, uh, as, as a means of seeing whether I enjoyed writing that, and I did. I never tried to get the short story published. It was just a, a, a practice run, if you like. And so the, the concept was that this young, uh, phenomenally rich and extraordinarily ruthless young woman arrives in London with a small entourage of devoted uh, 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 supporters, and she becomes involved in a sequence of um, bizarre murder cases. And uh, a young journalist becomes fascinated with her and wants to find out what her agenda is. He, he senses that she does have an agenda, but he doesn't know what it is. So the idea of the story was the journalist, Jacob Flint, trying to find out about Rachel. And along the way, getting mixed up in these murder mysteries. But I didn't know how the story was going to end. And of course, the price that I paid for that was it took a lot of writing <laughs> rewriting. <laughs> so it took me about three years to write it. So uh, by this time, I spent three years writing a book. I've got no contract, no publisher. Uh, I don't, it's totally different from anything I've done before. Uh, and um, it, was, it was in many ways a risk, but it, it was something I wanted to do. And luckily for me, it, it worked out and, and I got a great publisher, head of Zeus, and they, they uh, took it and, and um, did very well with it. Uh, and so I was then on a roll, really. What I loved about uh, Mortmain Hall is there are references to other Golden Age um, crime novels, if you, if you, if you know them. Yeah. Um, there's A Hanging Judge, which um, I'm sure people would recognise, Secret Society, Stocking Salesman. Um, yeah. Did you do that on purpose, put sort of little humorous tropes in oh, um, yes. for, yes. for, for the yes. people who know? Yes, there are, a lot, there are a lot of those, and it's been fascinating to see in some of the reviews, one or two of them picked up, and then one or two different ones in another review, and so on. And, and uh, both Mortmain Hall and Gallows Court have a lot of these, uh, these little uh, uh, things that it doesn't matter if you don't pick them up, uh, but, but they're there if uh, you're interested. Uh, they're a little, uh, little bonus uh, what about you, uh, Nicola? Do you do you add in some um, sort of tropes from perhaps Josephine Tay's novels um, to um, the, the popular in <laughs> Oh, sorry, Martin, we lost you briefly there. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Uh... <laughs> I, I'll just I'll just move on to Nicola. Do you add, yeah. do you add in any sort of uh, Josephine Tay uh, references to those who, who are really familiar with her novels? Yeah, I think, I think lots of people recognise certain references to some of the books along the way. And Sorry for the Dead is probably the most overtly that I've done that, really, because ever since I started the series, I kind of wanted to pay tribute to the franchise again, which is one of my favourite Tay novels. It's the book, which was the first one of hers I read, mm -hmm. that made me realise how different she was and how great. Yeah. And I still think it's a remarkable book. It's a chameleon book, you know, depending on your own mood and the world around you and, and how society is. You read it differently in different ways. But published in 1948, it was about two women who are accused of kidnapping and abusing a young girl. And in 1948, that was quite strong stuff, really. And it wasn't certainly the, the standard fare for Golden Age fiction. So I wanted to write a book that would see, even though I, I haven't got to that stage in her life in the natural chronology of the series yet, I wanted to move about a bit into his mind and show her publishing the franchise of her and perhaps go back to events, fictional events in her own life in the book 
that I've made up that might have led to that sense of injustice um, that, that runs like a, a real electric force through that book. And so the book is, is over three time periods. It's in the present day 1930s of the series, but it also goes back to uh, the time of the First World War when Tay is a young teacher, which she was in real life. Uh, she goes to the Sussex Downs, which is a place that she came to love throughout her life. She called it my country. Uh, so she goes there for the first time and, and she's teaching at the Horticultural College, um, which is Charleston, before it became the home of, of Vanessa Van Dyke and Grant and the Charleston we know. And that, that was inspired by the, the most chance of moments of going around a, a guided tour of that wonderful Charleston farmhouse. And the guide I was with just happened to say as a throwaway comment, oh, and before Charleston became what it is today, it was run by two women as a boarding house. And so instantly that clicked with the themes and the setting of, of the franchise there. And, and, and so I've imagined who the real life inspirations for those two women might have been, but, but given it a different, a different twist. Yeah, it, it brings on to sort of an interesting point, really, because although you're writing in the Golden Age tradition and you're setting your books in, in that period, um, both of you, are, you're writing for contemporary audience, um, the audience yes. now. Um, and I, I did find when I was reading both your books, your latest books, that there are contemporary issues that are addressed. Um, yes. So, for example, at Martin, um, I, I thought quite a lot about capital punishment um, while I was reading uh, Mortmain Hall. There's the hanging mm. in the background, but that's mm. very much in the background. But there's the sort of issue about um, women were less likely to hang and how women are treated in, in the system. Um, uh, whereas Nicola, um, the, the, the two women who run not a, not a farm, but this horticultural uh, centre um, are, are partners, they're gay, and um, they're treated really badly by the surrounding community when somebody dies um, on, on, their, on their property. Um, and um, it, again, you know, it's, it's sort of the issues of how women are treated, um, especially when they're partners and so on. So how important is that to sort of weave in contemporary issues or is it as, as it sort of just happens, just happens as a byproduct? Martin, start with you. Well, well, I, I think that it's absolutely inevitable that if you're writing a book in 2020, um, even if it's set in, in 1930 or, or 1940 or 1820 or 1511 or whatever it may be, it inevitably your writing is informed by who you are as a writer and where you're coming from. And if you read historical fiction of the past, you'll see that it, it does two things. It tells you something about the historical period assuming it's any good, and it will tell you something about the period in which it was written as well, uh, that, because that's, that's inherent, I think, in fiction and in writing. So there's no getting away from it. So I think that uh, um, I've, I've sought to embrace that. I've not tried to shoehorn in to my 1930 stories uh, stuff from the present day, but it uh, there are aspects of it that I think inevitably seep in. I was very fascinated, if not slightly taken aback, to see one uh, lovely review in the States um, of Gallows Court talking about Me Too and, uh, and Gallows Court. I, I, that, and of course, Me Too came along after I started writing that, that book. So it's not as though I've planned it. it it's just that things... Um, there, there, there are some aspects, this is the old Agatha Christie point, uh, aspects of human nature that are eternal, whether we're talking about today or 50 years ago or 300 years ago. And this is what comes out in fiction. So you get these resonances, I think, from time to time, wh whether you intend to do it or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Nicola? No, I, I, think, I think it's very important for me, not as a, as a sort of issue thing. I think you, should, you never really go into a novel wanting to bang on about it. Particular issue. Um, but since I started this series, I've had an awful lot of letters or emails from people whose mothers or aunts or grandmothers or friends, or even in some cases themselves, have wrestled with the same issues of sexuality that Josephine has been wrestling in with, with throughout the series, with her relationship with Martha and her sexuality in general. Um, and these women who really, really didn't feel they had a voice in that 20s and 30s period, didn't feel that they could, they could come out within the circles that they, they lived in and who either were brave and made the choice with their heart and suffered from it or who kept their silence and perhaps lived 
a different life, which made them unhappy in, in a different way. And so I, I did want to talk about that in, in this book. Um, and I did want to develop how that might feel. And interestingly, exactly what, what Martin just said, um, I was writing Sorry for the Dead at the time when Brexit was really at its height. And although they are very def different divisions, very different sorts of social angst and unrest, um, that divisiveness as a society really, really struck me. And of course, it, it does again today, again, a different set of divisions. But I think I, I wanted in that book to show how that might feel from the inside for those women. Mm. Um, Martin, your um, Mortmain Hall, in the very first um, chapter, um, one of the characters says it was the perfect crime. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that sums up quite a lot of golden age fiction. It's, it's sort of yeah. the plot, isn't it? Whereas for a contemporary audience, we don't want, just want the plot. We want characterization no. yes. as well. How, 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 how easy is it to sort of balance the two plots and characterization when a lot of people who love golden age and therefore will love the style of writing um, are interested in what, in what you said earlier, the puzzle. Yes, well, well I, I think Dorothy L. Sayers was one of the writers who grappled with this and was probably the first significant uh, detective novelist to actually have a great detective in Lord Peter Whimsey. Um, after a number of books, he falls in love with Harriet Vane, who's being charged with uh, the murder of her her lover, a uh, former lover, and and that relationship continues over the course of a number of books, and that hadn't happened before, because you know Sherlock Holmes doesn't really grow as a character, <laughs> Miss Marple doesn't particularly grow as a character, Poirot, uh, and all the others. So even in in the golden age, writers like Sayers were aware of of these issues. And she was, I, I think, a pioneer. One or two other writers did it as well, and several writers followed her in the Golden Age. Um, and interestingly, uh, several of the, uh, the great male detectives married very strong women, very powerfully drawn female characters. That's, that's a, a recurring characteristic. So, so I think that, um, that these issues are much more important now for writers and for readers, but, but I think that they were about in the, in the Golden Age as well. It, it, it wasn't uh, a period of writing uh, as, that was as two-dimensional as, as we've sometimes been led to believe. Um, oh, Nicola, um, we've got a really intriguing opening chapter in, in your latest book, um, which um, I then spent most of the book trying to work out which character it was. So it is that sort of golden age style puzzle. And yet your character of Joseph Teche is, is wonderfully drawn. Is that something you feel need to balance as well? Again, character and the plot? Yeah, I think so. And I think every book happens in a slightly different way. But for me, plot often comes quite late on in the devising of a book. I, I usually start with setting and with character because for me, they tend to determine what sort of crimes might be committed and what sort of plot you'll be able to develop. So the books do really start very much with, with the people and, and the setting at the heart of it. But I agree with you, so I think, I think it's so important these days. And I think P.D. James is one of the greatest of writers to combine that setting and plot and character and to make them so much greater than the sum of their parts in a, in a, in a book like Death and Holy Orders, which is, mm. which is the crime novel probably that I wish I'd written. It's that, that setting on the Suffolk Coast is so indivisible from, from the plot yeah. that P.D. James creates around it. But uh, yeah, they, they, they all do start with the people. And I think, I think you have to have that puzzle because I love that as a reader. I think you also have to have, uh, if you're writing it within that period, what, what somebody once called, I thought this was, this was exactly right, the sinister sparkle of the golden age in terms of the murders. Um, um, I always think very carefully about, about the murders in, in the book that I'm doing and the sorts of murders they are and, and, and what then can, can lead out from that and that, that writing of the body. Because I think, I think the body is, I mean, it sounds a dull thing to say about science fiction, most of which does deal with murder, but that the finding of the body is, is, is such an important thing. So, so that for me is, is, is where I honour the golden age, perhaps more, this, more than in the characters themselves. That's really interesting because I've reread P.D. James during lockdown and it is that, again, that sort of golden age type uh, sort of plot and so on. Um, 
maybe if we could just find a finish on if you can tell me a little bit about what you're doing next in terms of your your novels are we going to expect another josephine tay book and another uh, rachel savonek book uh, martin well um i've just been working on a late district mystery I've, so i've got uh, i've gone back to the future so i'm i'm uh, I've, I've been working on uh, a book called the crooked shore um i've probably written it now faster than any other novel i've ever written uh, so that's, that's that's been good uh, so that's nearly finished and uh, that i hope will come out next year uh, I, I would like to get back up to the late district to <laughs> do a bit more research before i finish it but i've been working on that i'm also working on uh, uh, a big non-fiction project and then then i hope to get back to uh, rachel seven eight book three great thank you and nicola yeah, there's a, a new Josephine coming out in November called The Dead of Winter, oh, which is a riff on the Golden Age Christmas mystery. Uh, so I've been <laughs> reading lots of those in the research for it. <laughs> and it's set on St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall, oh. in the middle of, of a snowstorm. And never did I think, really, when I was writing it, this tale of Josephine and Archie being stranded and cut off on this island, that it would live <laughs> in reality, um, <laughs> rather than the weather. So it, it's been strangely prophetic, but uh, you know, it is it is perhaps the the most golden age of all the books that I've written. I, I think there is something lovely about that kind of Christmas tradition mm. for that, and it, it does have the uh, talking of real people. They they meet a world famous film star while they're there. So uh, that, that's what's coming up next for me. Oh, sounds brilliant. Thank you both ever so much for joining me today. Um, we hope to see you in real life um, at Buxton very soon. Um, but thank you in the meantime and good luck with your writing. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Martin. That was lovely. Thank you.